Apparently that's my saying for the day for some reason. Uh, so we're into our last talk now before lunch. Uh, so, you know, heavy burden. No, it's, I always enjoy the last talk before lunch. It's always my favourite talk slot, personally. Uh, so uh, now we've got Chris, who is going to actually be talking about making his own game engine, which I actually have a soft spot for, because at every point during my development life, I make a terrible game engine and then throw it away. Uh, so I have such a soft spot for people who also try and make their own engines, because it's a fascinating challenge. Uh, so take it away, Chris. Turn on the microphone. Is this uh... all right? Yep, no, good. good afternoon. My name's Chris. Um, I'm a freelance software developer, and I've been running Linux on a desktop since uh, you had to edit your own X386 configs to get Netscape running on your 486. So, just showing my age. Uh, I flew in from the west coast on the red eye last night and got about one hour of sleep. So I probably shouldn't be operating machinery, but um, we'll see how we go. Uh, last year, I built Pix3D. It's a free software Pixel 3D game engine that runs in the browser, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Pix3D came about as a result of participating in game jams. Does anyone, has anyone here done a game jam? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's an event where people build a video game under very tight time constraints, often 48 hours. Um, I, I really enjoy the game jam format. It's a way of making games with friends in a time box that won't eat into my working hours as a freelancer. Game jams hone some important real world skills as well, like how to be economical with dev time, how to avoid scope creep for your projects, um, and many of the most interesting problems in computer science actually crop up in game dev, so it's good for uh, skill development. I'm here as part of Infinite Lives. We're a game jamming collective from Perth started by a couple of friends. We're mostly building game jam games and tooling with Clojure. Clojure is a concise and expressive Lisp-based language, which makes it great for rapidly building things. So it's perfect for the Game Jam format. Clojure runs on a few different runtimes, including the JVM, .NET, Node, and the browser. Clojure Script is a variant of Clojure Script that transpiles to JavaScript and runs in the browser and Node.js. I'm also here to tell you how to win at Hacker News. I, uh, when I announced Pix3D on Hacker News, it got uh, 285 vote votes, which is the most of any of my posts has ever got, and it spent a day on the front page. We all know that Hacker News popularity is the most important metric in software quality, um, like how when Linus announced the first version of the kernel on Hacker News back in 1991, and that's why we're all here today. Anyway, I'd love to see more of the deep tech from uh, LinuxConf attendees in the uh, people from the free software community on the front page of Hacker News. So I'll go through some of the things that seem to have worked so you can use that info when you publish your own work. I'll try to avoid the dirty word marketing, but that's actually what this type of activity is called. So what is Pix3D exactly? It's a 3D pixel aesthetic game engine that runs in the browser. It's built on top of the 3JS library, which itself wraps WebGL, which is the layer that lets your browser make OpenGL calls directly. 3JS is a great library and takes care of the rendering, input events, and a lot of the maths. Basically does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, deploying on the web, the web's a nice way to deploy games because you don't have to worry about platform builds. Uh, anyone who's been developing for a while will know that in the old days you'd spend half of the game jam just trying to get the builds working on Windows. The two major features of Pix3D are the opinionated pixel aesthetic and the live reloading of Blender models. It's built for rapid iteration during game jams rather than production video games. Uh, during a game jam, you have to do everything as quickly as possible. And Pix3D came out of a desire to make pixel art quickly. I found it was much far, faster to build a few low poly shapes in Blender than it was to draw every pixel sprite by hand. So I got to thinking about how to turn 3D models into pixel art. The pixel thing also saves on CPU. Essentially, you only have to render at one quarter of the screen size and then scale it up. This means the engine runs pretty well on a mobile phone as a pro progressive web app, despite the fact that it has the entire browser running. I've, I've also been very influenced by uh, Lisp REPLs and the live reloading of code that you find in the Clojure universe. Both major Clojure script browser coding environments, FigWheel and Shadow CLJS, are built around a mechanism that hot reloads your functions into the browser when you save. How many people have used a uh, hot reloading 
code environment. All right, and a couple here. Yeah. How many people have used uh, Clojure or Clojure Script? One, two. Um, so you can change what a function does. For example, a click event handler, save the code, click the button again, and see the new behavior without having to refresh um, and reload your application code. So I'll show you an example of this. I'm gonna, just going to launch the, I'm going to run the server. And I'm going to edit the source. down here. There we go. All right, so this is a very simple Clojure script um, pro, uh, bit of Clojure script code running React and rendering into the browser. Um, basically, I'm just going to demonstrate the live reloading. So what's happening here is it's doing get element by ID on the document and getting an element called app <coughs> in the HTML. And then it's rendering this home page function into that app div. Uh, and the home page function, all it's got there is a div with an h2 tag of hello world. And that's what you can see here. So now if we add a little button, and we're going to save that, what this button does is it has an on-click handler that throws an alert. I've saved it, and so the button's appeared live in the browser. I didn't have to refresh it. And if I click that, I get it. the uh, event handle is fired. So it says hello. <clears throat> Just to uh, prove that it's what's actually running, I'll say uh, goodbye. Save that one. And when we click it this time, we haven't refreshed the page, but we get goodbye. It does the same thing with CSS and uh, everything else. So that it, it means basically the development cycles very rapid. You can iterate quickly on um, ideas and user interface ideas. So, um, so coupled with the Lisp syntax, I don't know if you noticed, but when I was editing the editing the syntax there, you get quite a. You can basically grab things by the braces. Um, Lisp helps a lot with uh, wrangling code basically makes you able to do it a lot faster than other languages. So coupled with the list syntax integration, the, you get good productivity gains. Um, but I'll try not to be too much of a Lisp zealot. Uh, once, once you've used it, it's hard to go back to other languages. Although, of course, no one wants you to deploy Lisp in production, so you have to. I wanted to bring this idea of live code reloading over to the art side. So I built a setup that compiles and hot reloads your Blender models into the running game when you've uh, saved the file. So I'll show you that now. Basically, what I'm going to do is go into Pix3. Uh, this is the Pix3D engine. And I'm going to say, make watch. And this is going to fire off to, uh, to background, a background task here that watches the assets. Now I'm going to open up Blender. Um, sorry, it's going down here. And I'll do that over here. And I'll minimize and put Blender on the same desktop as this so you can see it. Too lazy. Minimize that one. And run Blender. So this is the actual Pix3D engine itself. Whoops. Um, yeah, you can see basically it's rendering 3D models in a pixely kind of way. Um, and Blender started up. Where's that down here? <clears throat> so now what I'm going to do is edit those models, and you'll you should see them update. So I'm going to edit this spaceship here, and where's it? Okay, luckily I happen to have it open right there. So let's grab a few of these vertices and let's make a big pole coming out of the top and then hit save. Whoops, it's not save. 
And we should see a pop-up here. Did I save? Is this? <laughs> now, of course, something's going to go wrong. Save. Oh, it's probably stale code. Oh, it's running the wrong code. OK, let's try that again. So save that one. Now let's refresh this, because it's disconnected from the server. And I'm not connected to the internet. Sorry, just bear with me for two seconds. Let's connect to the internet. I've got some libraries loading off the web. OK, so now we're connected, and we should be able to Refresh this one. Is that going to work? Let's restart the build. <clears throat> but so the idea is that this background, um, where's my? So the idea is this background task here, where it says starting blend file rebuilder on public models assets.blend down the bottom. That's watching the uh, assets.blend file, and then. Uh, converts that file into the thing that 3JS can read. And when it starts building, compiling. Unfortunately, one of the things about the closure tooling is that closure can be quite slow. Build completed. OK, now let's reload this. OK, now let's zoom in a bit on our ship so we can see what's going on. Now we're going to try that edit again. And obviously, once you've got this all set up, it's good. But if you had to do this every time, that would be quite annoying. But now we should see it pop up. Finally. <laughs> all right. So yeah, the idea is you can be here in Blender you know, on, a, on two monitors, and you can be editing your 3D models and your code at the same time, and they update in the live running game. And it just makes the feedback loop much, uh, much tighter. Um, so almost all the work done here is by Blender, 3JS, and the Closure Script tooling. You can see a, you can access a compiled version of that demo if you want to check it out um, online at um, infinitelives.github.io/px3d. Yep. So how it, what, how it works <clears throat> is uh, simply a giant bowl of code spaghetti. That looks like this. Uh, you have your make file with a rule called watch, which runs two bits of code. It runs the Blender, the shell script called watch and build assets. And the second thing it runs is the shadow CLJS closure script compiler. These both sit there waiting for changes. Uh, when you hit save in Blender, uh, the watch and build assets script checks the timestamp on the file. And if it's newer than the last run, it, it makes a call to a separate instance of Blender which runs in headless mode. So that's this here. And it runs this Python file called export scene.py. <clears throat> Excuse me. That exports the uh, .glb file that 3JS can import. And it also writes an M the MD5 sum of the resulting file into assets.clj. So this file here. When a closure script, um, when the closure script compiler sees a changed file, just like it hot reloads code anyway, it assumes that you've edited that file and saved it, and that's what caused it to hot reload the models back into the browser. And uh, that's how the whole thing works. So how can you make a game yourself with this? Uh, I've called it a game engine, but it's, that's a little bit aspirational. At this stage, it's really more of a tech demo that you can build a game on top of. Um, you have to know ClojureScript, as that's what it's built in, but uh, that might be a good language to learn anyway. Uh, in the spirit of closure, I've tried to find the right balance between abstract and opinionated, so you can take this and use it as leverage to make your own game. The pixel aesthetic, 3D modeling, and live reloading are opinionated, but beyond that, you can build whatever type of game you like. Probably the best way to get started is simply to fork the repository yourself and start tinkering. Um, if you do that and you have any feedback, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, I want to make it easy to use Pix3D as a library, and I've been doing some work on that this month. So if you're interested, you can follow along. Uh, we're at 
um, at Infinite Lives One on Twitter, and on our GitHub page, infinitelives.github.io, you can find a mailing list sign up, which is where we post when we release new stuff. So feel free to get in touch. So how much time do I have? Cool. So now I'm going to take a fork in the road and talk about how to win at Hacker News <laughs> because this, because uh, Pix3D went to number one. And, uh, you know, hype is not a great measure of quality, but for something quality to be known and appreciated, it does require attention. Um, if you're going to build something that you want people to use, you have to let them know about it. I've had quite a few projects do well on Hacker News now, so I'm starting to see some trends in what I've had a lot more projects not do well, so I'm able to see what kinds of things work and what don't. This is a chart of the position of, oops, sorry. This is a chart of the position of Pix3D on the day it hit number one. As I said, I'd love to see more free software and deep technical content on the front page and less gimmicks and politics, so hopefully you can use this to get traction for your own projects. Um, this isn't scientific, it's just what's worked for me. The first thing is to do good work. Uh, they don't always get it right, but people have quite an evolved sense for when you've invested time and effort to build something versus when you're selling snake oil. There's no shortcut to doing good work. You just have to put in the time researching and implementing things. Um, luckily, that's a very fun way to spend your time. So just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Pix3D was very quick to build, but only happened because of several years, you know, working in disparate areas like browser dev, games, and 3D modeling. Um, my slides are not updating here. Less fun for nerds like us is telling people about what you're doing. I've had to train myself to do this, but it really does help getting the word out about your projects. When I announced Pix3D, it di I didn't post the GitHub page, I posted a blog post about the tech. All you have to do is write about what you're doing as much as possible. It helps to restrict yourself in word count. If you feel like you have to write 2,000 words, you won't end up doing it. And when you do, no one will read it. So writing a low impact, you know, 280 word tweet or a short blog post, uh, setting a word limit is an effective thing to do. The way I think about this is, what's the point of making something if no one uses it? Writing is a, gr is a way to help the people who need your thing find it. So yeah, I'm trying to get in the habit myself of always writing when I'm building things. There's a great talk um, on YouTube called Juice It or Lose It. It's a talk about adding juice to video games. Um, they take a simple platformer which is very flat and they keep adding juicy details to it until it feels super fun to play. You can do the same thing with blog posts and GitHub readmes. Use animations and sound, read some design and layout and color theory tutorials and apply what you've learned. Work on the copy and rewrite things often and get feedback from people. The game pictured here is uh, not the one from the talk, Juice It or Lose It. This is uh, Star Guard and it's made by Lauren Schmidt, but it's a great game and you should check it out. Um, <clears throat> use multiple forms of media when you're posting. I use Byzans Record and Gifsicle to create and edit animated GIFs. So all the animated GIFs at the beginning of the talk were made using these. And Term to SVG is a good utility for recording terminal re sessions for the web. Um, basically it records everything you're doing and then you can save it as an SVG and publish it. And the great thing about that is it's just an image so it shows up on your, you can put it on your GitHub page and stuff like that. <clears throat> so compelling title is important, especially with the Hacker News thing. I think uh, a title really helps that initial traction. Think about what you want from a blog post or a GitHub project. Like basically you want to learn something and you want to be entertained. So do this for your own readers. Uh, your title or GitHub byline should tell the user what superpower they're going to gain by using your software. Your text and images should entertain them a bit. So like instead of it's a widget builder implemented in Python, say build web widgets faster in Python. So you, you know the second one tells the user what superpower they're going to get when they install it. And it's more fun to read. Um, the other thing is posting often because uh, most stuff you post on Hacker News is going to tank. Most projects are going to get ignored the first time you post them. And as I'll show you in a second, it's quite random what gets up there. Here's a list of some of the stuff I've posted on Hacker News. Most of them are show Hacker News items, um, which are my own projects I'm trying to spread the word about. Most of them only have one or three stars. At first, when you do this, it feels bad, but you get used to it after a while, and it frees you from having to care about what Hacker News thinks, and it's more just a tool for 
getting your stuff out there. Um, now, imagine if you spent your whole life working on one thing and then posted it once and it tanked. That would be pretty brutal. So instead, you should post each time you add a new feature or make a release. Um, that way, a lot of times it will tank, but then sometimes you'll get some traction. Uh, to demonstrate this point, I have a pretty good A-B test. I posted one of my projects as, an, as a show Hacker News, and then a couple of hours later, someone posted the exact same project again. Um, my post got six upvotes, and his post got 148 upvotes. I have no idea why. They were the exact same URL, and the title only had two words different, show HN. Um, so yeah, don't worry about what Hacker News thinks. Increase your chances of exposure by posting stuff often, and then focus on making your things quality. Um, and all of this advice goes for other media too, I think, like Twitter, Product Hunt, etc. This year I've been trying to learn about this like elusive marketing thing, and this is basically what I figured out. You just got to do a lot of it. You got to be putting stuff out there all the time and just try and make it good quality and uh, bring value to people. Um, <clears throat> so this one's less important, but I generally post just before New York wakes up. It's not scientific, but based on an analysis of my own posts, um, there were lots which tanked when I did post at that time, but all of the ones that did well were mostly clustered around that time. Um, it could be coincidence, but for my data set, it seems to hold. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much for coming to listen to me talk. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some stuff. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, you can find me at mccormick.cx. Uh, that's my website. I also have a newsletter there you can sign up to. I'm building a ton of experimental software on decentralization, web stuff, music tech, um, and I post about that. You can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, MCCRMX is my handle. Um, and I'm also giving a talk later on Wednesday at, in the main part of the conference uh, on a piece of software called Piku, which is a bit more technical, that lets you do Git push deployments to your own servers. So pushing stuff up into the cloud in a way that's similar to like Heroku. So if you're interested in that, check that talk out on Wednesday. And I should have had some sleep by then. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Chris? No, I've, I've got one. How long did it take to get the blender hot loading working? Uh, it was about an afternoon or two. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was basically because all those pieces were written already, but because I like used a bunch of different software across different fields, was able to join it together. Yeah. Like the live reloading thing came from ClojureScript. Blender is scriptable with Python. And because I'd done some other work in the past with that, I knew how to do it quite easily. Nice uh, <laughs> question at the back there. Have you seen people using this in game jams? And what was one of your favorite things? No, I haven't yet, uh, because I, it's very. It's I, I, it only I only released it like um, a couple of months ago, and it's it's not that usable at the moment. It's more of a tech demo, but uh, yeah, this this at the, during January I'm working on getting it into a bit more abstract. So, for example, I would like to break the Python tool, the Blender Python integration, out into a separate thing, so that you could use it with just raw JavaScript if you wanted. So yeah. So the way they, that this actually works with the 3D drawing, is that done, does it use any DOM manipulation in that, like you showed in that little closure demo, or is this all canvas-based? This rendering here? Yeah. Yeah, so that's 100%. Uh, so the way, it's 3JS. So the 3JS library is a JavaScript library which um, abstracts away WebGL, and a WebGL is a wrap around OpenGL. So if you've ever done any OpenGL Programming, it's uh, very low level. You're talking directly to the graphics card. What uh, 3AJS does is add a bunch of abstraction on top of that. So like that spaceship there has an object and you can you know, set the X and Y position and stuff like that. Um, what I've added is the, the particular aesthetic, so making it pixelated um, and uh, some of the shader, like the shadows and things like that, and also the hot reloading. So what is that box, the box that has the 3D drawing in it, what is that? Is that like an That's element a browser. 
Yeah, it's a browser window. Yeah, but you've obviously got a, a DOM element up there as well. Is that is that DOM or is that within the within the is the whole thing a three D yeah. scene or is that okay? Yeah, I get what you, I get what you're saying. Sorry. Um, okay, so yeah, it runs inside a, an element. So you've got like a so you tell three JS render into this div element, and I've just made that div element the size of the whole window. But yeah, you're right. This little uh, frame rate measurement thing here is a separate div sitting on top of it, right. and you can add stuff on top. So like uh, OpenGL is it's difficult to do text rendering. Um, but you can just do it with the browser. So you can just overlay text on top, which is quite useful. Yeah. And um, when, you, when it re-renders, so when it updates the model, uh, it keeps the same state in the application, but it just renders a new frame? Is that the way it works? Uh, so what it's doing there is it's taking the... So all of these assets are in one file, <coughs> uh, 3D models, um, and they're getting hot-loaded into the browser, and then it's replacing all the ones that are on in the mesh in the scene. So 3GS has a scene grapher. Do you know what a scene grapher is? Yeah. It's like yeah, it's yeah. So 3GS has a scene graph, and it's replacing the models in the scene graph with the new ones. But it's not actually rerunning the application from the start. It's just no. Yeah, cool. No. Yeah, and that's a closure script thing. Is don't rerun the whole thing from the start. Like you can maintain state between hot reloads of your functions. So. If, if you write your code in a functional style rather than like an object-oriented style, it's much easier to get it working because you've just got pure side effect free functions and you can repl they get replaced and then the new function gets called the next time. Do you have any other questions? No? Then uh, join me in thanking Chris once again. Thank you.